You're listening to People in Profit, a podcast that focuses on elevating humanity through business, sponsored by Conscious Capitalism Arizona. And now, let's hear from our hosts, Jeremy and Sarah. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the People in Profit podcast brought to you by Conscious Capitalism Arizona. We're your hosts, Sarah McLaren and Jeremy Neese, and we're super excited to be talking today to Brian Moore on how he is elevating humanity through business in his organization, Anthem. But before we dive into the conversation, we want to share for just a minute about conscious capitalism. Free enterprise capitalism has served to lift more people out of poverty than any other socioeconomic system ever conceived, empowering social cooperation, human progress, and elevating humanity. Good business is the answer to many of the global issues mankind is facing. It is what we'll dive into on this show. Conscious capitalism is a global movement with chapters across the U.S. and across the world that is on a mission to wreak the truth that good business is about doing good business for all stakeholders, creating a higher purpose for your organization that can benefit everyone. Our Arizona chapter is focused on highlighting the amazing businesses and leaders in our state who are pursuing higher purpose and consciously creating value for all of their stakeholders. If you want to find out more about conscious capitalism and the Arizona chapter, visit ccarizona.org. So on that note, let's jump right into our conversation with Brian. Jeremy, tell us a little bit more about our very familiar guest. Yes, thank you, Sarah, for all that information. And uh, it is a familiar guest. Uh, Brian, you are uh, probably on the Mount Rushmore of the Arizona chapter of Conscious Capitalism, one of our most recognized names and faces. So thank you so much for being here. Well, I might argue you probably need to raise the bar a little bit if I'm on some sort of uh, monument of any kind where things have gone terribly south. Oh, boy. Once again, (laughs) your modesty crowds out the room. Um, Here, I was nervous about what you were going to say to introduce me. And uh, we started, I mean, we can't get much lower than where we've started. So there's only one way to go from now. I mean, here we go. Let's see what we can do about that. Uh, For those of you that don't know Brian, though, uh, just a a real quick rundown. Um, Brian is a Midwest transplant and is really done phenomenal things here in the business space of Phoenix as an entrepreneur. Go Bears. (laughs) Hold strong to the roots. Um, uh, Brian has uh, seen organizations grow. Uh, To use your language, Brian, you like to strike the match and see if you can get a fire rage in. And so I think that's a really good uh, encapsulation of what your uh, journey through the business uh, world has been here for uh, for yourself and for all of us to get to witness it. Uh, see, it's a good time spent in the talent acquisition space. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about now in your new endeavor with Anthem, a social platform, but uh, that would be such a, a minor encapsulation for uh, what you've got in store on that. And then as far as conscious capitalism goes, you know, I look at your passport as one of the most stamped that we see, you know, you have been on the board for the Arizona chapter for several years, as low, as well as the international uh, group, you've been on the board, you've been our chapter leader in 18 and 19. Uh, notable MC, you've run some of our TEDx events, many of our standard events, let's see, you interviewed the governor at the at the international events. Uh, author, what what else? What am I missing here? Family man. Um, yeah, I was going to say musician. The, the, what else we got? Uh, we yeah. only have an hour, Brian. I can't <laughs> list them all. <laughs> well, then you know what you nailed. There it, it is. You all right. It. So um, exciting things happening for you. I guess for the Conscious Capitalism crew, I'd be curious if you would be so kind to sort of recant your journey to this group and sort of how you found the path and how it's shaped some of the things where you've arrived at now. Yeah, happy to actually. That's a story I haven't talked about in a long, long time. So thanks for asking. Um, It was 2012. I was at the very, very beginning of my partnership with Max Hansen launching Y Scouts, a purpose-based executive search firm. And, you know, for anyone that's had any connection to the executive search space, it's historical orientation is either by industry or job profession. So if you're going to hire an executive search firm because you need a leader, you typically are going to go to a firm that specializes in your industry. So they have that immediate common knowledge of, you know, your language, your lingo. 
uh, your unique your uniqueness, uh, and or you're going to go to a firm that specializes in a particular profession, whether it be finance, marketing, so on and so forth. And what Max and I were trying to do in 2012 was bring to bear a whole new niche, which was finding individuals that not only had the leadership experience in either the profession or the industry, but also had that human alignment, the purpose, the values of the individual matched what the organization itself was pursuing and the values that guided its daily behaviors. And I, I, I don't know, in hindsight, uh, I think we were just a little early to market trying to create and sell a different niche to employers. And it was really, really difficult because we were trying to change buyer behavior. And you know, every time we were on the phone with somebody that was clearly in need of a great leader, the question was, well, tell me about the searches that you've done either in this industry or for this exact job. And our response was, listen, LinkedIn has democratized everybody's professional history. It's all there. You know, the, the, the competitive advantage of having access to some special group of candidates for all intents and purposes had been evaporated. Yesterday's model. Right. Yeah. And so what we are doing is very different in uh, bringing this new level of alignment on top of those requisite skills, uh, experience, educational requirements that most firms would, would really laser focus on. And we were having a bear of a time. And so I was in a Whole Foods market one day uh, and passed by an end cap. And this was probably beginning of 13, 2013. And the end cap was decorated with a book, big, bright, shiny, yellow, you know, highlight marker color book called Conscious Capitalism that was co-authored by Whole Foods uh, co-founder and CEO, John Mackey. So I pick it up, I leaf through it a little bit, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I buy it, take it home, I devour it. And I'm like, oh my God, like this book was written as if I were writing it about what I believe, right? It was obviously put together in way more of an organized fashion than anything I could ever do. But I'm like, if this, if I could only find these leaders, if I could find the, the, the CEOs and the COOs and so on and so on, and the presidents who are leading the organizations according to this doctrine, I think they'd appreciate what Y Scouts is all about. Makes sense. And so just with a little bit of Googling, I learned that later that spring, April of 2013, there was indeed an annual gathering of conscious capitalists that was happening in San Diego, California. San Diego. So spot. Max and I buy tickets to the event. We go to the event and it was like discovering plutonium by accident. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, they're like, here's our people. And every single person that we described what we were trying to do with Y Scouts to was like, awesome. When I need executive search, I'm going to use you guys. That's the formula. So that was how I fell into it so accidentally and how I immediately became enamored with this practice of capitalism at a higher level than just the short term shareholder focused model that had gotten us to where we're at. Listen, it, it, it helped get humanity to where we are. We just need a, a, a new higher level of its practice to get us to the next stage of where we're going to go. So that's how I stumbled into it. And from that day forward, it's been a, an integral part of, I think, who I am. Um, that's just, yeah, it's my beliefs. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, um, so now 13 is sort of your aha moment. Yep. Light bulbs go off yep. and you see this. Yep. So tell me more about how you continue to integrate yourself into this community and what yeah. that looks like. So obviously through that first conference, meeting a bunch of amazing folks, uh, starting to build connections with them. And then as luck would have it in 2015, I think it was the summer of 15. It might've been the summer of six, uh, it was 14. Anyways, don't hold me to the exact date. A couple of summers later, <laughs> uh, Conscious Capitalism, the organization CCI was going through its growth spurt and was in need of a new senior leader for their team. And uh, I got wind that they were going to need some help. And so I told Max, I'm like, listen, if there were any organization that we would ever donate our services to pro bono, this is this the is one, the like this is it. Uh, and so uh, Y Scouts was happy to uh, do an executive search for Conscious Capitalism Inc. And I think as a result of that, at least the story I've told myself is, the board at the time was certainly appreciative of what Y Scouts was doing to assist in a process that was, um, you know, it's a difficult process to find the right person and go through just the volumes of folks that had expressed interest. 
And uh, I think as CCI's way of appreciating what Y Scouts did, they invited me to join the national board, which I, I don't even think that at that time, the board chair was able to get the full question out <laughs> before I said, I'm in. Yes, yes, sign me up. Uh, and that was probably, yeah, end of 15, beginning of 16, somewhere in there. I think it was the end of 15, beginning of 16. And I've been just honored and humbled to sit at a table that I still pinch myself that I get to sit at and uh, be a very, very small part of providing whatever guidance, expertise, experience uh, that I can to help steward this practice of capitalism moving forward. So it's been, yeah, it's something I'm, I'm, I talk about as much as I can. That's great. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you being in that seat, whether you know, you're know you the least in the room or not. We don't judge you by that. <laughs> yeah. We are happy that you're there. Oh, a great group of people well, be surrounded thank, by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, Brian, so that's those are uh, some new stories and things that I, you know, didn't know. So that's, you know, kind of cool to, to learn new stuff and, and, and how you were, in, you know, even involved in providing your services directly to the international organization. Uh, what I'm curious about is, uh, and of course, I'm really curious, and I know we're going to spend so much time talking about Anthem, but that's, you know, my main curiosity is to learn a lot more about um, Anthem and how it works and, you know, the way it's, you know, creating connection. But before we go there, um, uh, you know, we had uh, a CCAZ event last week with uh, the executive director, I think that's his actual title, whatever his actual <laughs> title is, I don't know, uh, you know, Alexander McCormick on with us. And he really talked about, and, and Steve Hall, um, another board member. And that conversation was very heavily focused on the importance of conscious, uh, the importance of community to conscious leadership development and the importance uh, of uh, developing a strong, you know, conscious capitalism based business, being so heavily reliant on a conscious leader, and how, you know, a lot of what Steve's experience was, is, you know, again, having that network of other leaders to kind of be on the, the journey with. So my so to bring that to an actual question, with your participation, long participation on the CCI board, uh, how is that helped you uh, as a developing conscious leader uh, to be a part of that, you know, community for your own development and for your own, um, uh, the benefit of your own businesses? Uh, th thanks for, for asking, Sarah. It's a great question. I think more than anything, it's about having access to other folks who think in, in a similar way philosophically. Um, you know, there's that common cliche statement, if you are the CEO of your business, that it's an incredibly lonely position to be in. And, and I have no doubt that it is but just due to the decisions that need to be made uh, and the lack of folks that sometimes you have access to bounce those decisions off of. At the end of the day, the buck stops at that person. And I think conscious capitalists, by and large, are in a similar position right now, right? The movement is nowhere near the size that it's going to eventually become. And if you've been involved in it, whether it's last week or 15 years ago, it is still not the norm. And being a part of the conscious capitalism community is about having access to other like-minded and like-hearted leaders that uh, align to your way of thinking and being. And if, if, you know, if you are in, a, in your own kind of isolated echo chamber, kind of pounding your head against the wall, trying to convince others that don't believe what you believe, that can be really, really challenging and can easily dissuade you from following that path. And so having access to a whole community of other leaders at a variety of different levels in business gives you that outlet to bounce ideas off of, make sure you're not crazy, that you're not the only one that's thinking the way you're thinking. I mean, it's just helpful to have a peer group uh, who, again, shares that similar philosophy of the way business can be practiced to create value for all stakeholders uh, and also look long term uh, as much as possible from a decision making horizon. I mean, I think that's, to me, the biggest difference between the traditional practice of capitalism and conscious capitalism is stakeholder versus shareholder and long term versus short term. It's really not that big of a departure. Um, I mean, there's obviously more to it, but uh, to boil it down to something that's easily, uh, it can be described, that's what it is. And to have that community uh, of like-minded folks, I think is just huge. It, it just keeps your enthusiasm high. 
because there are those lonely days and weeks and months and you're like i i might be the only one that thinks this way when you're in your own local community or within your industry but having access to a larger group regardless of where they might live and the business that they're in just helps you stay on on the path i really like the, the um the channeling enthusiasm from the crew. I feel that as well. And I think that's one of the important things because there is no cap on caring for people and, and the love you pour in your business. And so when you can be surrounded by other people who are keeping that energy high and yep. keeping your, um, your disposition of openness to, Hey, what are you guys doing over there? Yep. That's brilliant. We should try that here. Yep. And, and the, you know, uh, there's just so many ways you can continue to expand what you're doing. And this is, a great group of people to be surrounded by to have those dialogues. No question about it. You think about a guy like Steve Hall, who I know, uh, as you mentioned, Sarah was uh, presenting last week with Alexander and Steve's industry is, you know, prior to selling the business when he did a couple of years ago, you know, he was building a used car dealer. Sure. Right? Yeah. So how many used car dealer owners and CEOs out there would you immediately think are going to be long-term stakeholder oriented practitioners of business? And it might, I don't mean to sound judgmental, but right. you know, oftentimes a used car dealer is used as the butt of a joke, right? Or the way not to do business. And so here's Steve, a, a, a leader that built his business around these conscious capitalism principles. Imagine how many times it was so critical for him to have access to a community of like-minded thinkers because he probably didn't get a lot of it, right. I'm guessing, inside of his own industry. So he is the trailblazer in that industry. And to keep that, you know, trail blazing, you need some jet fuel behind you when you're getting kicked in the face every day. Absolutely. And so having access to the community, I would imagine, uh, was a huge part for him being able to keep that momentum and enthusiasm high. Well, you know, and he said that's, you know, what he said, that community and then, you know, other, you know, networks, but the, um, I think that, you know, yes, enthusiasm, but kind of the way I took it from him and I'd like to, you know, hear how you can relate to this as well is a little bit of resilience because to be that conscious leader, it takes personal development. I think, uh, I, you know, I didn't write it down, but one of the, you know, quote worthy things he said is like the, the biggest gift you can give to your team is your own personal development and personal development is, um, I mean, that can be really scary, right? You have to get real honest with yourself. You have to be real honest with, you know, where your shortcomings are and even where you're, you know, where you haven't been honest with yourself in the past. And so, you know, not just a business model, but what about a business model that, you know, infuses, you know, love and honesty. And again, that personal development, um, what, what are your, can you tell us a little bit more on your experience from that perspective? Um, well, I, I agree with whatever that quote worthy statement was that he <laughs> shared. My guess mm -hmm. it was something along the lines that, you know, CEOs get the organizations they deserve. And it's really, really hard for an organization to grow beyond what the leader or leadership team is growing at, right? Like yeah. the, it's hard for an organization to surpass the leadership uh, ranks growth. Um, and so the more that the leadership team is willing to invest in their own personal and professional development, then the organization will likely follow suit. It's, it's, I, I don't, I don't know of any really good examples where the organization has surpassed the leader. It just rarely Nothing happens. comes to mind. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think it's, it's a brilliant quote worthy statement that, that Steve shared and it is scary, you know, business. Mm -hmm for the longest time has been this place where it's been devoid of uh, human emotion and our personal lives and, and this sort of like imaginary line between right. who we are at home and who we are mm -hmm. at work. And that's the historical view of business. That's okay. Listen, it got us to where we're at. And here we are enjoying the fruits of all the labor of the folks that came before us. And they operated in that model by and large. And now we're evolving just like everything does always like, it just keeps moving forward. And so this next frontier is one in which leaders are really recognizing that they need to show up uh, as a whole person, not just as some figurehead that's playing a part. And the more that they are able to, you know, whatever, if, if it's address demons from earlier in life or simply break through barriers that are holding them back, uh, whatever those scenarios are, uh, the more that 
a leader is willing to demonstrate his or her own uh, personal growth, then I think the rest of the, it sets a great example for the rest of the organization to follow suit. So, well, and well, I mean, and your current endeavor Anthem is probably a pretty unintentionally, but perfect segment, right? Because a big part of that is that, you know, a, a, a medium or a, a way to have a little bit more humanity and that, that human connection and uh, maybe even a way to create some vulnerability by exposing yourself in a way that maybe is comfortable. Does that seem right? And can you tell us more about Anthem? Sure. Happy to. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what we are trying to do with Anthem is to help teams perform better. And the, the, the research is irrefutable. The more meaningful relationships you have with your colleagues, the better the teamwork is. I mean, this is not like that genius of a statement. If I actually enjoy working with the people I'm surrounded by for the two thirds of my life that I'm working, you mean to tell me we'll do better work if yeah, I don't hate them? Be better. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I mean, this isn't like I, I haven't stumbled into anything that we don't already know. Now we're just trying to accelerate it. And uh, again, I think we're fighting against an old current of uh, you do your job and I'll do mine. And that's about the extent of our relationships. And, you know, I, I, I just think we deserve more as human beings that because of, you know, the amount of time we spend with our work colleagues, colleagues working on work, that we should actually have more meaningful connections. I'm not silly to think we're going to be best friends with everyone, but if we understand one another better, if we develop more true vulnerability-based trust with one another, a deeper sense of connection and belonging, the data says you'll perform better. So your clients that you serve with your products or services get a better result. And there's no shortage of evidence that the more deeply connected we are in our relationships, in our lives, the more we are happy and healthy in our lives. So there's no losers. There's no downside to building better connections with your teammates. And that's what Anthem is all about. We use storytelling and we use um, inspirational media sources to help people tell their stories. And the first one that we've chosen is music. Um, music is a universal language that everyone understands. I've not met anybody in my life that hates music. So that's a good thing. Literally there, nobody, nobody on this journey has told you, yeah, but music's not my thing. You know, people I have was, said music's not my thing, but nobody has said, don't make me listen to music because okay. I hate it. Okay. Yeah. There, there are certainly people at the end of the spectrum where it's like, yeah, cool. I like music, but when I get into my car, I'm not turning on a song. I'm turning on something Whatever. else. Got yeah. Um, so absolutely. There are people out there where music is like, yeah, but nobody is There's anti some music. connection. Yeah. There is some way. connection. Yeah, can't avoid it. And it's all, even for the, uh, and I don't want to go too, too far down the rabbit hole of the, uh, the, the, the music meh people out there. I don't know what to call them, <laughs> but even when the people who are like, yeah, music's fine. When, when you hear a song that reminds you of a time and place in your life, mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. It's a time machine. Right. You go back there. Junior you, high dance. I remember yes. they playing that song. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Every, uh, I think Could that, be anything. Yeah. that, that is, um, that happens to all of us. So we, we started using music as the first inspirational media source because of its universal connectivity. And as Sarah, you said, it helps create this sort of atmosphere of safety that not everyone's going to be willing to race into sharing a personal story about their life with a colleague. But what we've learned is if you give folks this additional connection bridge or storytelling vehicle, i.e. music, that sharing a moment or memory from your life in the context of the song that symbolizes it removes the majority, if not all of the scariness for those that either are introverted or shy or just frankly don't enjoy uh, talking about personal moments or memories from their life. And that has been a pattern we've seen time and time again since we launched. Naturally disarming. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And it just creates uh, this sort of like, uncommon commonality. These all exist, but unless we're willing to sort of like call them out and start talking about them, you don't actually know that you have things in common with your, with your teammates. Right. Um, it's not what you randomly talk about when you bumped into them in the hallway or chit chat before or after a meeting in the conference room, when you were seeing people five days a week, 
And because of all this physical distancing, because of how rarely we are actually with our teammates and how busy we've been able to fill our calendars from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, all of that informal, organic, serendipitous connection that used to happen has unfortunately taken a backseat to the productivity gains. And that's okay. But organizations and team leaders are now realizing that, oh, uh, we're actually missing a lot of what that social fabric used to happen, again, organically and informally. So Anthem is a way to intentionally begin to fill that void. And frankly, I think take it a, a heck of a lot deeper and to create more sustainable value with it because it's not a normal team building experience like doing an escape room or laser tag where when you get back to the office all you've learned is i really don't like being on jennifer's team because she doesn't <laughs> let me read any of the clues when we play escape room and randy is a really competitive jerk because you know all he cared about was being the laser tag king of the mountain or whatever right like i had the same issue with randy yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. so um no offense to, to no. jennifer good, or randy out no, there good people otherwise yeah so um yeah um, I feel now I feel like I'm rambling. So, uh, did I even answer a quite? Was there a question in there that I answered? Well, uh, I kind of forgot, but I think it was on Anthem. So I think you you have. So maybe um, you know to get more directly to the question, can you uh, give us like an example of how a company is using Anthem? So we can get you know a, a, I think we get the premise, but give us the picture. Yeah. So the picture is is team leaders who want to bring their teams closer together, uh, bring Anthem in. Step one is every member of the team individually takes their own walk down memory lane and catalogs a handful of life moments and memories that they feel are suitable for the workplace, right? You don't have to catalog things that you're like, ooh, I better not tell that story. Um, so, you know, people use their best judgment. We haven't had any issues. Um, so an individual experience where you catalog a handful of life moments and memories, you then choose a song that is symbolic of each one of those moments and memories. And then in the initial onboarding experience, I've been facilitating, it's about a 75 to 90 minute experience where we talk about why inclusion, belonging, connection, uh, vulnerability-based trust, like why, why do this kind of an activity, the benefits that you reap from it, both the business benefits as well as the human benefits. And then that leads into taking a group breaking them into smaller breakout rooms where they then engage in a story sharing experience and they share a song, they share the moment that that song represents and they just engage in this really cool unscripted conversation where the dialogue that emerges is like, oh my God, Jeremy, I had no idea. My, when I was growing up, I used to listen to that or holy cow, that same thing happened to my brother when I was 17 and he was a freshman in college or what, like you, you get the idea, know, you right. just never know. And the outcome of that, and I've seen it ev almost every time is people will come back from the breakouts and they'll say, oh my God. I was just in a breakout room with three of my colleagues. We exchanged stories for a half hour. I learned more about them in a half an hour than I have sitting next to them for five years. Wow. Why is that? Because you actually created a vehicle to talk about things that might not normally come up. And I think the benefit of that is not only do you get to know them on a more personal level, so safety increases, trust increases, but inevitably when conflict and tension arises, I don't know about you guys. I'm really good at immediately judging and labeling someone <laughs> why they responded in a way that wasn't what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So instead it's like, wow, I know Jeremy and Sarah didn't respond the way I wanted them to, but because I now know them at a deeper human level, I'm going to give them a way more generous benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And I think that's healthy for teamwork. Right. So where I have the background about you so that I know how to approach that conflict yep. in a different way. Yep. And now I can, now I can hold you in a space instead of just Jeremy, the VP of whatever your job is. And Sarah, the VP of whatever your job is, you're Jeremy, the person who shared mm -hmm. some stories with me that were really meaningful to you in your life. Sarah, you the same thing. And now, now you're, you're, you're human, just like me. And I think, Sometimes we actually forget that in yes, the workplace, Yes, you know, and, and this is our way of reminding people that we're all just people. We all have our own unique stories that have shaped who we are and how we view the world and to benefit to, to know some of those. You know, you said earlier that, um, it, you know, 
you're not expecting or, or, you know, even trying to sell or even wanting to sell the idea that through this experience, everybody would be each other's best friend. But, you know, uh, what you are, it seems like doing is building compassion. And I would personally say that probably would go much further. So, you know, whether or not something you really like somebody or they're your, you know, friend, best friend, you choose to do stuff on the weekend. If you've learned how to develop compassion for that, that person, I think that will actually get you much farther in those, you know, those human interactions and, you know, appreciation and acceptance of each other. I agree a hundred percent. I don't know that I could have said it any better, so I won't. You know, the other thing that uh, that I'm sort of picturing as you're describing it is that, you know, through the music, we can uh, evoke emotions. And when we have when we're feeling emotions and positive emotions, and that's, I think, a big part of how it works. So if we're evoking this positive emotion. And when we when we our emotions are turned on, a lot of our logic and overthinking and, you know, is turned off. And so some of that defensiveness can also, you know, be turned off, you know, through this positive emotion or second guessing or coming up with whatever judgment like you're talking about. And so now you've created this, you know, positive emotion. It's all, um, you know, kind of on the sly, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and I would imagine that, I mean, I don't know how much, you know, if it takes a bunch of repetition or whatever, but there's some brain rewiring going on as well. So in we in the past maybe had some other instant uh, automatic, you know, reaction that's triggered in our brain, you know, encountering somebody. And now we've, we've, you know, rewired that to some degree by kicking in these positive emotions. And now that's the connection that you have with this person. Yeah, there actually is a lot of neuroscience around our brain and particularly around music and what music does. I mean, it, it, there's a great book. It's called, this is your brain on music. It was written by a guy named Dan Levitin. And it talks about how music immediately takes you out of your amygdala hijack, that fight, flight, freeze, which I think a lot of us live in, in the workplace mm -hmm. We're we're ready to fight. We're Even ready to, we're, not we're ready to run or, we're you know, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And an act music helps take you out of that brain space into the prefrontal cortex where creativity and imagination live. And it, it kicks on to your point, Sarah, your emotions, you know, that, that, that part of the brain. And so that's a, I like being in that part of my brain. I know what it's like to be in my amygdala and it's a <laughs> it's dark and that's cold a, and rainy and scary and battleground. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a battleground. Yeah. And that's, you know, listen, I, there's a time and place for it. Um, but I'd rather be in the more creative part of my brain as often as I can, I think. No doubt. So yeah, there is a lot of neuroscience to it. I, I, I try not to get, go down the, like, if you have to prove to somebody that this is just better, it's like, all right, I'm probably wasting my breath. Mm -hmm. um, I've just learned to not try and, um, uh, what's the word I want to use to convince, I guess, uh, the unconvincible. That's just why. And the same, I, I learned that through Y Scouts. It just doesn't, if you don't believe what we believe, okay, that's right, cool. Right. Hey, you keep doing what you're doing and I'm going to mm -hmm. keep doing what I'm doing. And there's, and we just don't have the love there's connection for everybody. Yeah, yep. exactly. And uh, that's a hard thing to practice though. I, the, the hardest thing for me is because I'm so excited about it and I want everyone to be as excited as I am about it. Um, cause I think at the end of the day, we're, I'm just trying to help promote the best of what we're all capable of. And that's to get along and understand one another, develop that sense of compassion and empathy, kick on our sense of curiosity. And through all of that is where I think the best of our human qualities live, right? All of those proverbial soft skills that none of us ever get trained on that take mm -hmm. a lifetime to really learn. Um, and that's what we are, that's what we want to bring at, at a level of scale. Um, so Somebody stop me before I just keep going. <laughs> that was all very well said. So we don't really want to stop that. Um, just so I can understand. So you described the scenario where sort of a small unit, uh, a small group of people yep. will come together and, and do the storytelling, but you have a tool that kind of guides all that, right? So we they, do. they pick the music and it's almost like a jukebox. Like yeah. You, you can yeah. really yeah. listen to your song if yep. you wanted to. Yep. So does this also um, scale? Obviously, I know my immediate team and we get to have the, the deep personal stories, but yep. is there also... Hey, somebody that I only encounter when I submit 
payroll or something. Or my once expense a reports month. or exactly. whatever. Yeah, right. Totally. I, do I still have the ability with your tool to kind of learn about them? A hundred percent. Interactions with them. Hundred like? percent. And it's it's really up to how the organization wants to use it. But the next generation of the product is a scheduling tool where. It could be the CEO, it could be the chief HR officer, it could be the VP of sales, whomever it is, can either randomize or be deliberate with how they want to match people throughout the organization to have mini connection sessions after the initial onboarding workshop concludes. That onboarding workshop that I end up facilitating is just really helpful to kind of just explain and demonstrate and lead Mm -hmm. everybody through what this platform can look like in while it, you know, it, get one it, under your belt. Yeah, get one under your belt in, yep. in practical use. And then after that, let the technology do the matching. So let's say into, and I've, I, as a member of the team, I may say, hey, I'd like to have one connection meeting every two weeks. I would prefer it to be on Mondays or Wednesdays, first thing in the morning, because I'm fresh. And then the system will schedule me based upon the manager's preferences, either randomly or deliberately. And that connection meeting will, because Anthem can, review my moments and songs and yours in that calendar event can be a conversation starter of what the system learned is a uncommon commonality that we already share. Maybe it's a genre of music, maybe it's a band, maybe it's a life story, whatever it is, immediately we've got something where we can kick off that conversation, assuming you know we need help kicking off the conversation. Right. Um, so the idea is to get this as an integral part of the organization's way of doing things where they believe also that if we can forge better relationships amongst all of the members of the team, not just in a department, Mm -hmm. across departments, break down silos that might exist across geographies, make sure that the, you know, this office doesn't, and this office doesn't see each other as it's, oh, well, headquarters always does this and we're just a satellite, Right. right? Like there's all those dynamics where teamwork breaks down. Mm -hmm. And so how do you begin to rebuild those dynamics? And we believe through personal story sharing, like this, this is not hard. It just requires somebody committed to fulfill it and to do it. Absolutely. So, um, and then the next generation of the product, in addition to the scheduling tool is music is just a starting place. Well, what about the moments and memories from your life that might be connected to a movie you watched Mm, or a book you read? or a TV show that was part of your history, or a podcast you listened to, or a TED talk, or a family tradition, like Mm. a particular recipe that grandma used to cook uh, at every holiday season. Or maybe it was a road trip, uh, or every Sunday when you were a kid, you went fishing with your dad. What Like there's all these different inspirational triggers that we are gonna layer in so that music is not the only expression of the stories. There will be a variety of others And over time, imagine just the cool sort of social graph that an organization could have of its entire team. Here are the top 10 most listened to bands of our company. Here are the top two or top 10 most read books. Here are the top 10 most watched TED Talks. Here are the mood. Like then if you're a candidate interviewing, it's like, wow, it gives me a feel for what the culture is kind of like. Like there's some really interesting things that over time, I think we'll really be able to learn about cultures. It's a very different way of thinking of how a lot of cultural alignment is done today, but I think it'll be very, very valuable as some sort of a supplement Mm -hmm. um, down the road. That's exciting. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So a long journey ahead and you know what, it'll probably change 17 times before we get there. Yeah. It has to. Yeah, probably. But uh, you know, here we are in this accelerated virtual remote reality that frankly, I think is going to stick around in a meaningful capacity. You know, the five days in office environment that we all grew up in is probably gone for good. And so what does the future of connection really look like when, I mean, imagine being hired today or over the last year, chances are you've actually never met your teammates in person. How do you really feel a sense of inclusion and belonging if you've never met them? Mm -hmm. Oh, through the 17 Zoom meetings you're on? Really? I don't think so. So this is a way to actually help people build inclusiveness, connection, belonging, trust. But we've got to lower our guard to do it. And uh, that's what Anthem wants to do. That's fantastic. 
So just uh, initially the, um, um, the, uh, the initial process that the, you know, the very end user experiences is, is mostly just to help them identify those meaningful stories. And then from, but it's always in the aims to facilitate a connection conversation. Yeah, the individual experience that each member of the team goes through uh, is a guided storytelling process where, you know, we provide some sort of common life moments like getting your driver's license, your first date, your you know, graduating high school, getting your first job, having a, your first child, getting married. There's some common life moments that have happened to a lot of us, but those are just helpful suggestions. Every individual, it's their life. They know what those important moments are that have shaped who they are and, and how they view the world. And some of those moments might be really nuanced, right? Might have been the one time they were in a drive through having the worst day and someone in front of them you know, paid for their cup of coffee or whatever, right? Like it, uh, there's so many different moments that are a part of all of our lives that each one of us deems important because it's our choosing. Uh, so that individual experience is truly up to the, to the person. But yes, Sarah, the, the goal is, is after that individual experience is complete is to use that as a basis for building better connection with the people that you spend you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day with your cow. I mean, these are your colleagues you spend more time with them than you, than you do your family. Typically it's true for most of us. Do you ever, I mean, have you ever thought of, or maybe this, you know, it just wouldn't work this way, but um, like just having access to the catalog and, and um, knowing what people's and again, maybe it's not even set up this way, but I was just wondering, knowing what their songs were and what some of their pivotal moments were independent of the conversation. So if you couldn't have all the connections or, or you, you were, um, you know, going to have an interaction, a, a, a true business interaction with someone, or maybe a conflict with someone that someone that won't approve your expense report or, or whatever, and being able to, you know, see, you know, have access to what they, they, they built as a way to you know, understand them more, or it, it just doesn't really work that way. No, it, it's already set up that way. So oh, okay. every organization that has brought us in, all of the members of the group that go through it are part of a private group where they have access to each other's profiles. Mm -hmm. the, the public uh, security and privacy is at the top of our list. So every single moment or memory has its own individual privacy settings. So I might catalog something about a moment that might be a really deeply emotional moment that I'm not ready. That's not ready for prime time. I don't want to share it with anyone. I'm still going to catalog it, but I'm going to keep it private to just me. Oh, so, I love that. Yeah. I mean, every single moment has its own privacy setting and at whatever time, which may be never, I may be willing to expose that moment to my colleagues or to a specific colleague over time, but that's right. up to me as the author of, of my stories. Um, but to your point, Sarah, I mean, right now, when we have meetings with people, if we've never met them before, oftentimes we might go uh, pop on their LinkedIn profile to get a quick flavor of like, oh, I'm about to talk to Jeremy and Sarah. Let me go see what they've done in their career, just so I have something interesting to talk about, or I feel at least a little bit more prepared for the conversation. Wouldn't it be a lot cooler to actually pop on and review your Anthem profiles? Way better. Learn about moments or memories that are important to you, music you've listened to, books you've read, movies you've watched. I think that's just as if not more interesting than reviewing your LinkedIn profile. I think it's way more interesting and not just interesting. I just think it's got to be much more productive because, you know, I step in the room and I already, you know, in some ways know somebody and I can, you know, hopefully, you know, be two steps ahead of the, um, you know, who are they? And, and really who are they matters because who they are, it's going to influence what they think of me. <laughs> right? I mean, that's really what it comes back to. So I think that's really cool. And I love that it's, it's, um, that's an, uh, how it's being used. To me, it seemed like it would be uh, pretty beneficial, but I was like, well, if they're not doing it, it's probably because they know best. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, we, we set it up that way from the get go. So your instincts are, are 100% right. And I, I draw the distinction between most of us in the workplace know what our colleagues are. We don't know who yeah. our colleagues are. I was just are. about to make that comment on the LinkedIn. That's, is, yeah, I, I can I pop know. on your LinkedIn, Jeremy, and I know exactly, well, I can arrive at a fairly accurate conclusion of what you are, but I, it doesn't tell me who you are. Mm -hmm. 
It really just doesn't. Yeah, and, but no that's not what it. it's intended Correct. to do either. Correct. So this that's isn't nice. a bag on LinkedIn. Mm. Um, thank God LinkedIn did what they did because they really helped expose and democratize an ability to learn what people are. That's a good thing. Well, what about the other side of that coin? Right. Uh, that doesn't exist. I think, you know, some of the other social media platforms maybe in their earliest days, that was their intention. But unfortunately, so many of the social media platforms, certainly the popular ones, have devolved into these echo chambers of hatred. Um, yes. At least that's my opinion. Um, popular or unpopular as it may be. And listen, I can't remember a time and place in the history of my life where humanity has been at odds as strongly as we are today. I still believe we're way more alike than we are apart. And maybe Anthem can be a way to start putting it back together. Could very well be. There's, sure. There's, we have a thin veil of differences, but that, that that's, doesn't define us. It's because we're carrying the whatever label is of the group rather than our individual label. Like, yeah. Yes, I might it, agree with something over here, but sure. that doesn't mean that, that I, I'm all I embody all of the yeah. attributes that you might think yeah. belong to that group. Have you so something else that I was, you know, sparked for me when you were talking about, oh, you know, depending on, you know, how it rolls out, the information we can get about, you know, top 10 songs of the company and, you know, top 10 whatevers. Um, I wondered about if that could actually help with diversity. So if you if you actually identified too much commonality, could that be a way to kind of identify that, you know what, maybe, you know, our, our culture is a little too homogenous and, uh, and, and, you know, and we need to challenge ourselves on, on that, on that area. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly possible. I only have since August of 2020. So what is that? Nine ish months, whatever it is, uh, of experience, um, reviewing the collective, audience level profiles of the teams that we've done this with, which has been about, been about 55 clients. And I will tell you that um, on rare occasion are any companies homogenous, at least from the standpoint of musical tastes. It's fairly rare to get even the same artist to show up multiple times on Anthem profiles. So take a, take a team of 20 people and each person catalogs five moments. That's a hundred moments or stories that I have access to. And it's rare that you it's even have rare one where I see duplicates. Wow. There are way more unique bands and artists than there are duplicates. It's a 95, five split, which is really interesting to me. Now you, when you, when the five happens, it's kind of like, you know, journey. Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. There's it's, no too much Jerry it's, Garcia. It's, right? <laughs> no, you don't yeah. see too much Jerry yeah. Garcia, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but it's really interesting to see the bands that are the common ones. Elton John. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's super interesting. Like, what are the bands that, again, it's only nine months of ex uh, right. experience yeah. and recognizing it, but it's super interesting. Uh, like, later today, I'm going over to a, a bioscience company and doing an executive, I'm doing an in-person Anthem workshop with them, not virtual. So they're getting back together and 11 members of the leadership team, I'm, I'm going to be doing the workshop with not one common band wow. amongst 11 people, which is really cool. I think so. That actually reinforces like why I feel strongly that the place of business is great for social change because it's where you will be with a bunch of different type of people. You pick what you do after work, you pick what church you go to, you pick which teams you want to be on, yep. you know, your recreational life is self-directed. Yep. When you go to work, you don't the, get to, the person right. next to you. You didn't hire them you're in right. most cases. You're right. They're there because yeah. they're there Yeah, and we got to work together. And so that's, that's I think kind that, of reassuring to know that we aren't all just kind of filing into the same organizations just because there's some underlying thing that we haven't identified yet. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think the DE and I conversation is a, fascinating one. And I am not a DE&I expert. So I am anxious to, that, that I know at some point a DE&I expert is going to see what Anthem's doing and Mind they're going to say, data. hey, this is a vehicle to actually help shine a bright light on the DE&I conversation in a way that nobody else is shining the light on it. Well, hopefully to make it less threatening, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's typecast. Yep. Yeah. So we'll see. 
We'll see. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to stay <laughs> detached from what I think it's going to be, good. Um, which is good, hard. Yeah. It's really, really hard. Yeah, right. Super hard. Uh, yeah, let, let the world kind of tell us where it wants Anthem to go. So I'm a little curious. You've had this opportunity to launch this new initiative sort of post all of your conscious capitalism experiences. And, you know, the yellow book wasn't on your radar, the last business launch nope. where, where you have access to that framework. Any, anything change in your approach to starting this business to any of your previous ones with, with that knowledge? I, I think the only thing that probably changed materially is as my co-founder and I, his name's Jeremy, as Jeremy and I engaged in some of our earliest discussions that we were both very deliberate in talking about, like, what do we really want to accomplish? Okay. And we were so, and are so aligned on wanting to lead with a creating value and impact first and let the rest just sort of follow suit. That's and great. I think there's a lot of folks out there who want to build businesses for a variety of other reasons, which is fine, again, to each their own. But it was really important to me, as it was to him, that we were very aligned that let's go actually create value and impact for the people that we're trying to serve. And if we do do that, we think we have a shot at being successful doing it. It wasn't like, hey, let's go build something for two years, get it to a certain level, and then hope we can sell it for a big exit or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and again, I'm not saying that's wrong. That's just it's not what I wanted. It's not what you. he wanted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so having that very deliberate conversation uh, was 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 great. It was great to have. Yeah. And the, the big impact, uh, I mean, from what you've said so far, it sounds like it's, you know, building, you know, human connection in workplaces. And of course, I think you talked about, you know, productivity or efficiency within teams is, is that the impact or is there, or what is there more, what else is, it? <laughs> is there, is the, there more to the impact or uh, the, the big, the big purpose is to bring people closer together. I mean, that's, yeah. the, that's the North star for us. And that needs to happen in every realm of humanity right now. It just so happens that we're, we've started with a focus on the workplace, which happens to be the place that we spend the majority of our time as adults. So why not leverage the workplace as the place where we think we can have the biggest impact, at least to begin with. As you grow your team, you might want to check out this tool. It's called Anthem. It'll help you <laughs> build rapport amongst all those. Well played. Well played. Uh, another question sort of then and now, um, as you've been part of conscious capitalism for let's call it five plus years, we didn't necessarily pin you down to that start year when we won't, um, as you were doing that executive search, what do you gauge the state of the movement? Is this, how does it compare to what you thought when you first made your inroads to where things sit today? I mean, I think it's in an incredibly healthy place. I think, you know, the pandemic obviously wreaked all kinds of havoc in all kinds of sectors. And I think conscious capitalism and the team that's leading CCI approached it in a great way, learned a ton, was able to launch the senior leader uh, network uh, throughout the year last year. Uh, which frankly may not have happened had it not been for the mm -hmm. pandemic because you know prior to uh, CCI, its main sources of earned revenue were through its uh, in-person events. And with an inability to host in-person events last year, it forced the organization to innovate and uh, really stand up this new network, which I think has a huge ability to grow well beyond what you could host at an event and have the continuity of being around every week as opposed to two times a year. So it gives an ability for all of those folks looking for that community of like-minded, like-hearted individuals, regardless of industry, mm -hmm. to be a More part places. of all year as opposed to waiting for an event in the spring and an event in the fall, and then maybe uh, supplementing with what might happen in a local chapter if their market even has one. Right. right. So I think it's I think it's been a great year and I think we're very much at the beginning of sort of this next generation of what CCI has the ability to be. And I think uh, there's a variety of other groups that are traveling a very similar path, whether it be inclusive capitalism or the B Corp community that, you know, building uh, tighter bonds with all these other groups whose aim is the same thing to solve some of the planet's biggest challenges using business as the vehicle to do it. 
And to do that, we just need our business leaders to think beyond just satisfying the needs of a small group of shareholders or owners and benefiting a whole lot more people in the process. So I think we're in great shape. Um, and there's a ton of work that needs to be done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, read a headline. Yeah. It'll tell you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It would be really yeah. nice to turn on a TV program or uh, a social media site or whatever and actually read a good news story about business as mm -hmm. opposed to always the bad yeah. ones, you know, grabbing yeah. the attention, thrashing the headlines. Yeah. So, well, that's a natural plug for conscious capitalism, right? If you want the a feel good about humanity story related to business, then go to, you know, any conscious capitalism event, international or chapter. <laughs> So chapter wise. So, uh, you know, we need them and, uh, and we got them. Yeah. They're out there. There's a yeah. way more good stories than there are, you know, bad ones. It's just the bad ones sell a lot of advertising for the media companies. Yes. Jerks. <laughs> markets. I wish that uh, business model didn't work anymore, but it still does. Well, and it's a business model that, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there's always the whole thing of, you know, we consume a little bit of what we fed, but we're also, um, you know, what's getting the ratings, right? And, and where are people tuning in? And then, you know, that, that is the demand and that's being supplied. So, um, you know, maybe, you know, if everyone is, you know, connecting to positive memories through music, we can change that wiring as well <laughs> and, start and change what the demand is. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. Nicely done. Uh, how about any uh, standout stories from your time in the uh, in the CC trenches, if you will, and your favorite moments or um, things that I mean, there's would be been enlightening to these people. I mean, there's been a so bunch. bunch of... There's been so many. It'd be it would be really hard to pick out just one because I kind of have a, a catalog of memories that are at the events, uh, you know, sort of the, the connection memories of people that I either just met or I enjoy seeing once or twice a year and grabbing a glass of wine and yucking it up and laughing our tails off. And then there's those moments at the events themselves, s seeing and hearing an amazing individual on stage. I mean, listen, uh, interviewing Governor Ducey and Peter Rawlinson, the CEO of Lucid Motors at the event a couple of years ago. I mean, that's pretty cool. No Regardless doubt. of where you stand politically, to have an opportunity in our home state to interview our governor was a really cool moment. Um, as well as Peter Rawlinson, you know, uh, leading a electric car company to compete with the likes of Tesla out there. Mm -hmm. So that was a really, really neat moment. Um, but there's been a bunch of speakers and presenters that have just blown me away over the years. It's so true. Yeah. It just keeps the sandwich just keeps getting layered and layered with more good flavors. It's yeah. not like it ever yeah. grows tiresome. Yeah. It's what's, what's I think good. Jeremy was hoping you were going to share a moment that included him. Mm, well, <laughs> when I'm the lie. <laughs> I've met so many amazing people. I would have never known Jeremy or you, Sarah, had it not been for conscious capitalism. That's a good and point. Karen, Karen the, yeah. behind Business Radio X. Kendra. I had never met Karen either. Yeah. So it's like what's so cool about it is when you are pretty clear, very clear in what your beliefs are, you end up being immediately surrounded by again like-minded, like-hearted people. And it's just really easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I agree with you that uh if someone were to ask me that same question, I'd have a hard time answering it because it, it does get back to, you know, so much of the good feeling that you have in the event, as opposed to the details that were, uh, you know, the, the details, the who, the what did they say? It was more about, you know, I just got, I was energized. I wasn't, you know, uh, you know, it raised my enthusiasm level or I just, I think really it comes down to that connection. Uh, but it kind of makes me think a little bit about why Anthem also works so well, because again, you have this, you have the song, you get the feeling kind of like the conscious capitalism feeling, but then you dig into the story that's attached to it. And so you get a little bit, you, you, you not just have the feeling, but it, I think it really, it must strengthen the feeling because I know, I know why. And of course they get to relive it a little bit. Cause I think we know that, uh, uh, when you're when we're hearing stories, the same part of the brain is activated as if we were experiencing the story, right? So we do get to experience it, it you know, in a way again, and and have that, you know, that good feeling all over again. And then, even better than that, we have this important ex 
intimate experience and we share it with somebody else. And that also, you know, kind of, you know, strengthens it. So it, it just kind of seems like, you know, why is conscious capitalism great? And, you know, what are some of your best experiences or right along with, you know, what Anthem is bringing to. Well said. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting close on, on time. Too. Yeah, any final yeah. thoughts or anything you want to uh where can people find you at how can we uh learn more about anthem uh well uh if you want to learn more about anthem uh, the website is anthem.life uh, and anthem is spelled a-n-t-h-y-m so anthem.life l-i-f-e um and obviously we're you know you can find us on all the social media sites out there and uh and if you want to connect with me brian at anthem.life pretty straightforward um yeah perfect yeah always connected to that why right brian exactly (laughs) it is uh, yeah that letter y has been following Mm -hmm. me around since 2012 (laughs) sticky guy yeah yeah Uh, i have to attribute that to simon sinek that was was one of those ted talks and and his his book uh that that forever impacted my life in a a phenomenal way could not agree more Yeah. yeah i like the letter y it's a cool letter. It's it's got cool. It's got deep layers, right? It's a question. It's a it's the fork in the road. It's a cool symbol. It's a convergent point. Yeah, it's a convergent. Well, it's point. it's a question and it can be an answer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Boy, we this is just where we should leave people in a very yeah. deep we're, philosophical state. Yeah, we're getting all like yeah. Plato and Socrates like. <laughs> Well, because I don't want to, you know, leave people too, you know, philosophically buzzed up. Uh, if you want in- more information about conscious capitalism and the Arizona chapter, go to ccarizona.org. And the next couple of events that we have coming up there, uh, um, we have uh, the next in our the next installation in our activation series on April 28th. That's this Wednesday. So you can go to the website and sign up for that. And then the following Wednesday, May 5th, we have a virtual conscious business chat. So uh, that's, uh, I think, where we'll leave it for today. Thank you so much, Brian. And of course, Jeremy, um, always uh, fun to spend an hour with you. And uh, thanks to Business Radio X and Karen. So I guess that's it. Thank you. Thanks Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to People in Profit, where we showcase the businesses that are elevating humanity through their work, right here in Arizona. Learn more about us at ccarizona.org.